Meet Green. Green is a former student of mine, and in this picture, he's smiling. He's smiling because he's in science class, and there's nothing in the world that he loves more. But when it comes to algebra, Green struggles. He has trouble paying attention in class, and he hates when he gets home and his mom tells him he has to do his homework. His teacher, Mr. Petten, is also frustrated because Green doesn't pay close attention in class, and that means that he has to explain things to him after class and also after he does his homework. But the way that Green does his algebra and science homework has changed. Now, when Green gets home from school, he opens up Study Egg and opens up his most recent lesson from Mr. Petten. It's a short video, so he just hits play. What he hears are the concepts that he needs to know to succeed in his class explained by his teacher, exactly what he needs to be successful. But what's different about Study Egg is that partway into the video, Mr. Petten has added a question. The video pauses, and Mr. Petten quizzes Green right then and there to see if he's understood the question. Let's see. He's learning about graphing and variation. The five-point summary consists of Green was paying close attention. He nails this one. It's the first one. He hits resume, or hits continue. All right, we're just going to jump ahead to the next question. And uh, the standard deviation is the square of variance. Now, Green thinks he's been paying close attention. He thinks that he understands this question perfectly. He, he guesses true with a lot of confidence and finds out that he's, he's got it wrong. Now, the bar at the bottom shows him with a red dot that he should go back and visit that. But I want to show you what his teacher sees. When Mr. Petten logs into Study Egg, he sees a dashboard. This dashboard, at a glance, shows him exactly how his class is doing, how many students completed the assignment, and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Now, he knows that Green wasn't paying close attention in class, so he looks at Green's specific performance and finds out he actually did pretty well. There were a couple questions, one on the difference between variance and standard deviation that he'll make sure he talks to Green about the following class. Okay, Sci uh, algebra's done, on to science. The thing about Green's science homework is he was so excited by the lab that day that he finished it before the bell rang. So he logs into Study Egg and browses a long list, hundreds of lessons. We've taken videos from Khan Academy, TED Education, from, from, bio, from Berkeley and other sources, and we've added assessment layers onto them. Green finds one that's similar to what he's learning in biology. He opens up one on DNA, and he sees that same short eight-minute video, the perfect amount of time to consume some information with interactive questions along the way. I want to point out one thing on this. The teacher, the content producer who made this video, added an animation at the bottom. I'll zoom in on that in a moment. Uh, great, and you can see a landscape and an egg. There's always some sort of uh, base image and an egg, and as he goes through the lesson, it animates and fills in. So Jason, if you could just show them what that works, what it looks like. Great, and there's always a creature at the end, and this is a way that teachers customize lessons and communicate progress towards mastery to their students. Here's another one, uh, a leaf and an egg turning into a bird. Teachers choose from lots of different animations here. So Green has done his science homework. He's done his math homework. Uh, he's learned with a video by his teacher or by a great educator. Um, he knows where he needs work. His teacher knows where he needs work. And he's done his homework when that video ends. So it took us a while to get to this product. Um, we've tried several different products in the education space over the last year. Um, and the first lesson I want to share is very close to my heart because it's one I've learned the hard way. And it's manage teachers' expectations really well. Being a great educator is probably the hardest job in the entire world. We can't make teachers' lives any more difficult. So that means managing teachers' expectations around bugs, around what platforms you support, around your feature roadmap, and when different features will realistically be implemented. The second lesson is keep it simple. The reason why teaching is so hard is because you've got 25 students per teacher and hundreds of standards and benchmarks. There's just a boggling amount of data. Anytime you in try to introduce a new product, a new workflow into that fray, you find resistance. When you try to simplify things, your product is welcomed with open arms. And that's what we've built our company, Study Egg, around. It's removing things from the learning process, removing noise so that students can learn more easily. We've removed the need for a book and a worksheet the need for students to uh, tell their teacher where they need help. Teachers already know. And as we go forward, we're going to remove even more noise so that students can learn the simplest way possible. Thank you.
Well done. So what do you guys think? Assessment layer on top of existing videos out there um, in the space. You guys are not creating the videos, you're creating the assessment layer. What do you think, Joe? I think it's really good. I think it's kind of going into um, a key of flips classrooms. Exactly. And so the classroom is more for collaborating, and then the homework is more watching videos and, and as you said, like going through the lesson plan. Exactly, exactly. So I think it looks great. Um, because you can, okay, here's, here's all these great Khan Academy videos, here's all these great um, iTunes U, but what are you going to do with them? I think yeah. that's the key component. Exactly. It Part almost feels like building the videos, Joe, was sort of phase one. Phase two is building exactly. the tools around the video. And uh, David, this is pretty close to what you guys are doing at No, um, although a little more crowdsourcing. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think uh, I love what you guys have done. And just one question. So one of the frictions that we always see is the creator-consumer problem. You know, two to five percent of the world are creators, and the majority are consumers. Yeah. But your model has the teacher kind of in the center of creation. Can you talk about that? Because that may be a point of friction. So we make um, lessons for virtually all standards and benchmarks in science and math. So if you're just consuming, you can just choose an existing lesson. No, I'm thinking as a, as a teacher. So a teacher could come in and say. Yeah, a teacher can choose an existing lesson. Great. So and when you say lesson, you mean the questions layer on top of the videos. Exactly. But what you're getting to is, exactly. is a teacher going to have to create these questions? And exactly. are exactly. teachers going to have the time and the skill set to build the questions on top of the video? And yeah. mainly the time, because teachers and the don't time, have the time. Yeah. They, so they clearly have the skill set. Yeah. So at a click, they can just assign a, a Khan Academy video with assessment material. That someone else has created. That someone else has created. Okay. Are you familiar with Teachers Pay Teachers? I know. Mm -hmm. So there, there's Explain lots of... Explain what Teachers Pay Teachers So Teachers Pay Teachers is uh, lesson plans and lesson materials built by teachers available online. Those are free or sold. Uh, and so a teacher can just find an existing lesson plan. That's the model that we're shooting for. We have tons of open source material. We also have uh, content created by teachers that can be uh, made available for free or sold. And what's your revenue model? That's exactly it, the Teachers Pay Teachers model. So less than $5 lesson purchases, which still put the entire course in the hands of the teacher. Dave, thoughts? Uh, great demo. Um, will kids go home and watch more videos at home? I'm just, I guess I'm a little bit concerned about them sitting in class, listening yeah. to the presentation in class, and then going home and having to hear the same presentation and then answer questions around it. Are you familiar with flipping the classroom? I'm <clears throat> you are. I heard yeah. that description, but I'm yeah. not familiar with so that. So that model is super early, and it's unclear whether you'll students will, or teachers will flip it in the context of the classroom or at home. Right now they can do either. So for example, a student with an iPod Touch can do the lessons in class or go home and do them. It's the teacher's discretion. Got it. And people can pace themselves. So if you're so brilliant at biology that this, what the teacher's talking about is you know, six months behind you, you could sit in the corner, put your headphones on, and do the next seven lessons, and the teacher can catch up through the tools and see how far ahead you actually are. So exactly. different okay. paces. And then the teacher can spend a little extra time with the people who are slow, while the people who are fast get even further ahead. Right. Yeah. But just one quick point on that. Everyone in the class is still doing the same lesson every day. They can do extra lessons. But so one thing that we found is really important is that you don't have some students finishing the entire course within a month and other students not finishing at all. It's still important that students are in it together, kind of. Everyone Joe, do you agree with that as a teacher? Like, if I'm just brilliant at biology and do, you, do I have to experience it as at the same pace of the average student or God forbid the slowest student? Or would you rather your, you know, a, a, your ace biology student that she just race ahead and finish in a month instead of 10? It's, that's, I think that's the big question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Because I think with, I've seen with No Child Lost Behind is it was kind of putting um, weights on the students that just excel while like the students it was trying to it was ho holding back like the 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 students that get it really quickly it was really holding them back so i don't know i would love to see it like if you excel in biology just to go forward but i don't know the answer to that i think it's still it's still yet to be proven i would love to see that happen but i don't know but jason we've seen those models already both in k-12 and post-secondary we've seen those models in k-12 and post-secondary and in K-12, what a lot of teachers are doing is they're turning those advanced students into teachers. So in the flip model, they're actually facilitating other students, yeah. which is an incredible way to get deep learning, self-confidence, a whole bunch of things that go beyond math. Leadership and potentially exactly. inspiring people to be teachers. Can I Top. jump on that for a second? 
Uh, let's let the, uh, some a little more uh, feedback from the judges. Thomas, Betsy, thoughts? Yeah, a couple a couple questions. It looks it looks really promising and really neat. And I, I also loved your lesson learned about uh, being really explicit with teachers. I yeah, think that that uh, that's a really really important point. Um, so to that end, a couple of quick questions. Number one is, if I'm a teacher and I want to put my own lesson in there, so in other words, I'm I'm going to be part of that two percent. Um, on average, how long is it going to take me to kind of collect the elements that I would need to do a full, you know, a full lesson, uh, you know, pick whatever standard or whatever I'm teaching to at the day, say I'm teaching the periodic table today or something. What on average is going to be the full amount of time that it's going to take me to put that lesson together right now with, based on the people who have been using your system? So the people who have been using our system so far are already classroom flippers. They already have their own videos. So in that use case, you've already got a video, you've probably already got a quiz, and you've just got to line up the, uh, the times. And we do that to help some of our early beta testers, but they all, we also so, have an So interface. make an estimate. If I have a video that's 10 minutes long and it's got 10 questions in it, how long does the tool take to put in 10 questions to a 10 minute video? Um, Ballpark. So if you've got the video, you've got the questions, 10 minutes. Oh, sorry, uh, maybe 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah so two okay. or three minutes per question just to seed them in. And whatever it takes to make. Would you agree, yeah. Jason? Yeah, it's about that. Good. And then a second question is, you know, uh, we uh, we saw some tools yesterday that um, aimed to um, pull together the data from individual tools so that teachers have one dashboard, right? So we don't want to make teachers feel like they're piloting airplanes, right? And, the, and, and that they've got like 14 dashboards to control. So my question to you is, how much effort are you putting into developing your own dashboard and the data that you surface versus how willing are you to collaborate with others who might be, you know, wanting to simply suck your data in and present it in their own format? So collaboration is huge for both distribution and for just providing value to teachers so they don't have a million dashboards. Right now we're with Edmodo and we plan to uh, support other LMSs as well. So the data is just already there for teachers to see. I assume you have an API? Uh, we don't have an API yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, always okay. build your product from API from day one. That's uh, rule number one, startups. Uh, Come on. Tom is good. Thanks. <laughs> so so I, like, I, I like the flipped classroom model. I'm very familiar with it. I've looked at lots of companies, uh, funded one that does something similar. Um, um, Academize, just for reference. Um, I, I think you know one of the problems that that you have and companies in your space generally have is that you are ahead of the curve of where reality is. Um, so you're you're developing for something that hopefully will happen sometime in the future, um, but your investors and your employees and maybe you um, might not have you know the longevity to actually get there. So in education, we think. Um, you know, in five and ten year increments. In technology, we think in five and ten months increments, right? So, so that's kind of where, where I think when you, when you start fundraising, you'll hear that from investors a lot. It's like, what can you accomplish in two years? And two years is an eternity. When I ask you what you can do in two years, you say, well, we'll have the same conversation we had two years ago, and maybe in six years we'll, we'll be somewhere. So I think there's this discrepancy. Um, the, uh, the other part is I, I liked everything I saw, but I didn't see, like, the true value add. Um, you know, it's like we take Khan Academy, we put something on top of it, we put some, uh, um, some uh, quizzes and analytics behind it. Like, you know, you're going you're gonna to sell into, into school districts that are going to evaluate this inside out and, and you know, 12 months of, of evaluations and all this, then you're going to ask them for money. And by that time, Khan Academy has, has plucked in a little, you know, gadget to, to do the same thing and you're out of business. So I didn't see, like, the true value add. Why should I use this versus... You know, yeah, how do you worry about being just a feature that Khan Academy adds? So right now, Khan Academy is not an integrated experience. You have the videos, and then you have an interaction that happens in a totally separate part of the site. Um, we believe there's a huge value by integrating that whole Yeah, experience. but what happens when what Khan happens, does that? Yeah. What happens when they do add it? Um, I mean, you know, Khan, every, I think every teacher is kind of like aware of Khan and likes it, or you know, at least has played with it. They have huge... Gravitas, they have $4 million in funding. That's not even funding, it's just grants. Yeah. Um, you know, they can do a lot of stuff, and everyone wants them to succeed because um, everyone in this room wants someone to succeed making education better, or, or many people. For free. Yeah. For free, exactly. So, so I think when, you, when you're a for-profit um, in education, you just have to think these things through and say, well, how can we add value yeah. over value. and beyond um, mm -hmm. what is there to make it a business that people pay for? Or you say, well... Maybe this is really interesting, but it's for the continuous education or for the universities who have a very different, you know, it's just a very different model. So Okay. Let's end on that can note. I, can I address that question? Quickly? Yeah, we have to move on. Um, but you can totally address it at lunch where you'll have a table. Okay. And yes, you guys please can find me. Uh, let's hear it for study egg. <laughs> <laughs>